So what is architecture? Architecture for me uh, is really about uh, innovation, I would say. And um, that means um, the way I define innovation is usefulness um, for people. And how can you make things um, better for the livelihood of people? So everything that we innovate with, whether it's um, cost models or just design techniques, there's always an end goal of uh, developing some form of innovation. And that innovation becomes important if it becomes useful. For example, you know, any technology that is out there in the world always makes people's lives easier. For example, the computer, right? It's um, a calculating machine, it gives us access to the technology of the internet, it, you know, it just makes our lives a lot easier, a lot more accessible. Um, so that is super innovative. Um, so how can architecture participate in a discourse of innovation and how can one bring to the world architecture that has um, a smart, intelligent focus to it that can, again, change the usefulness and change the way people inhabit buildings but also change their experiences in relation to what they know about a building and what it may be. So everything consolidates for us into a um, kind of a, a way of doing it, making it accessible, and allowing it to affect people's lives. And that's the intention, and that's what, we, that's what I really believe architecture is about for us, in any case. So architecture can affect people's lives? Absolutely. But it has to affect them also with regards to usefulness. It has to become a useful armature to people's lives, right? Um, which is difficult when you think about it. Um, but it does change the culture of building in a way, right? For example, if you have a super good building, um, the intention is in any case that you alter the people's vision of what architecture can be. And if you can do that, then even if a little bit, you even have people question everything around it, then we succeed, right? So it's just really a little bit about that. It's about just having it uh, infiltrate and question people's everyday existence. And if it's done that, then it's been useful because you've gotten people to think. And, you know, so there are different levels of this, right? The level of production is very important. And that you just have to be strategically smart, right? So, for example, when we work uh, with developers, we always come up with one nuanced thing that is different than some corporate architect would have come up with, right? So, and what is that? For example, in New York, we fought zoning laws to be able to go straight up. It's, it seems like a small thing, but it's a huge deal in New York City, right? And that changes what a building looks like, you know, um, completely, radically, in, in a very strange way. Or for Samsung in Korea, we developed the technology to generate a master plan in 12 minutes as opposed to in one year with all the regulations. And this is a country with the stiffest regulations. So we've made it useful for Samsung. Now the question is, how do we make it useful for the user? And that's a much trickier question because they have so many precise laws and regulations. For example, if you have a 59 square meter apartment, you pay a lot less tax than if you have a 60 square meter apartment, right? Yes. So how do you, or how does one circumvent these sorts of issues to produce great design? And that's kind of the challenge always. And can you maybe tell us something more about your position in this course? Uh... My position is very clear. You can follow the trajectory through all my books and 380s. Um, I'm really interested um, in techniques and their viability to produce a new aesthetic for architecture. Um, I'm very interested, and my partner and I are very interested in elegance, just because we're, you know, my partner's born in England, I grew up in England. 
it's one of those things that it just is, you know, we want to be like the James Bond of architecture, so <laughs> we're interested in elegance, right? Um, the Aston Martin, the lifestyle. But I'll tell you what altered my notion of a sensibility, right? I mean, I loved Saarinen's work, always have. Um, and then I walked through the TWA terminal in New York before they've now completely deconstructed it. But So I landed at TWA and they, they have these amazing tunnels that lead into the building. And I felt like I was James Bond. It looked, felt amazing, you know. It's this great space and you feel so good walking through there. Um, but in a, in a very structured manner, it doesn't allow you to go wild or skateboard in it or whatever, right? It's a very like, refined experience. And I just thought to myself, that's it. It has to be, it's about elegance. It's about having people want to be someone like James Bond when they experience it buildings. And so elegance for us stuck. So now it's a question of what does that mean, right? What is elegance for architecture, right? The scientific theories behind elegance. Those scientific theories um, are not what I espouse, which is um, the least amount of information with the lar largest amount of production, right? So an elegant algorithm, for example, is the least amount of code to produce the most maximum effect. That to me is not that interesting um, I, because that deals with um, efficiency-based practices and I'm not one that believes in an efficiency-based practice. I'm actually one who believes in a um, constellation of difference, um, but with technique, bringing those differences together to produce a very robust architecture. So when you move through it, your experiences are completely varied, right? And that's my biggest criticism for all architecture I've been in, is that once you move through it, you can't tell if you're on the 25th floor, or the 27th floor, or the 10th floor. I mean, it all looks the same, right? You have no idea. So the question to me has always been, so how do you experience those, uh, or a building, or have different and varied experiences on the inside so you understand where you are in relation to the form of the building, right? That's one. The second one is then those experiences are developed through the architecture. And the architecture gains the momentum to develop an interiority which is different from floor to floor or from one area to another area on the same floor. So now my, the design research and the way we're positioned uh, in our design research as a practice is to try and produce the interiors through the architectural manifestation of the building so now you're discussing structure and elements such as that to clients, you have to have structure. But guess what? It also provides an incredible interior, right? So that's kind of our position. Very clearly, based on technique, with an elegant aesthetic. But now we're really trying to push the interior of projects with an exterior uh, fascination of form to try and convince clients that uh, we should get the interior budgets too, right? Because they don't need another interior designer anymore. It's like, it should be part and parcel of our architecture. And here you go, and you're not paying much more for it. Just give us more fees, right? This is how we think. So in each case, we try and bring, bring a slightly different strategy. Project in Dubai, for example, we told the developer that we came up with a system where he could sell the unit, the apartment, in cubic volume as opposed to square feet. So you can have really big apartments in, square, in plan with lower ceilings, or then smaller apartments with really high ceilings and charge people the same amount if you do it volumetrically. And he thought that was a great idea because there are very large families, you know, they don't want to pay for really amazing apartments with huge ceilings, so, but they can still have four bedrooms and get it quite cheaply. And those apartments go in the middle of the building. And the middle is the hardest part of selling a tower. The top is easy, penthouses. The bottom is easy, commercial. The middle is the problem. 
So all that circulation comes through the middle, all those l lower floors are in the middle, and then it goes higher on both, in both directions. So, so we always try and use some of these ideas um, uh, and position them to be smart in addition to all the positioning of our practice within the contemporary discourse of architecture. Uh, you've talked already a lot about your method, about your... Uh, maybe you want to say something else about what your method is <laughs> in architecture. I mean, and, yeah, like what I just said, it's about the differences um, and really enunciating the differences, but yet bringing them together with regards to an elegant condition. And I think that that's a challenge. And if the project at the end of the day looks completely effortless, you know, like, Bond doesn't look like he's put in a lot of effort, right? But there's a lot of effort. Yeah. I mean, you know, the guy, whichever Bond it is, probably worked out six or eight hours a day, right? Uh, to look that fit and wear suits that just fall perfectly, right? It, it looks effortless, but it's not. It's the most amount of work to make anything look effortless. And that's sort of where we're at. And that's the struggle, you know? And it's not a great commercial practice because we put in too much effort into uh, trying to, you know, solve every single little detail perfectly. And the world is not a perfect place. Um, and there, like my partner said, there are a lot of dead people along the way. I mean, there are always the sacrifices, but you try and push everyone as hard as you can to develop the best project that one can. Even a small-scale project, it takes an incredible amount of effort because you're struggling with budgets, you're struggling with issues all the time. So how can you manifest um, your intentionality uh, within these limitations? It's, you have to be really smart with how you spend the money, but then you have to really rely on people who are part of your team and believe in your work to produce things cheaply. So, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out and they, they go out of production and, you know, you have to deal with all these sorts of things. But um, it's fascinating. It's, it's exciting and we love doing what we do and, it, you know, it gives us a great opportunity and lifestyle and, yeah, and it's great. No question. And I really think that elegance has the potential to cross the cultural thresholds. You know, I discussed this a little bit the other evening. But uh, what makes a supermodel a supermodel? Right? Have you thought about this? This is fascinating. It's like, you know, I'm thinking about why do some models become supermodels and others not? And uh, it's the being able to cross the cultural threshold. Right? So if you uh, can move from one culture to another culture and I still claim beautiful. It doesn't matter, matter if you're a man or a woman, but if you're still claimed as beautiful, you're a supermodel. So if you have local features in a region, you will always remain a model. You'll never be able to cross the cultural threshold. I think elegance leads to sophistication and now it's really about sophistication because uh, I think the same thing. I mean, we, if our work is received as well as in Japan as it is in New York or in London, then we've crossed that cultural threshold. And that leads to sophisticated work, which is elegant.